Has the housing market hit bottom? Home builders admit they've been wrong before. What's different today? I'm Sean Snaith, and it's time for Money Talks America. Welcome to Money Talks America. I'm Sean Snaith, Director of the Institute for Economic Competitiveness and your host for Money Talks America. Today we're talking about housing. Some people call it a housing crisis. Others refer to it as a housing slump. Call it what you may. An estimated one million U.S. homeowners reportedly are facing foreclosure. The charts really tell the story. Take a look at new home sales. The downturn started in 2006 but as we all know, it's just plummeted since then. Sales of single-family homes in 2008 are down when compared to 2007. This chart showing the median sales price of new homes sold is just as dramatic. Those numbers translate into real problems for real people. While Republicans and Democrats in Washington wrangle over solutions to fix the housing and mortgage industries, bank-owned and auction signs are replacing for-sale signs on the front lawns of many homes in many communities. And as Alice Collier shows us, the effect is often devastating. You're looking at one of the casualties of the bursting of the housing bubble that until last year, many people denied even existed. This home has been on the market for 12 months and now the value of the property has dropped significantly. But still you worry about about your family, because those are the people that you know and love. Meet Haley Smith, a single mother of two young children. She works full time during the day and attends college at night. Haley purchased the three bedroom, one and a half bath home in 2006 for about $195,000 at a fixed interest rate. Overnight, it seems, the mortgage payment soared because of taxes and insurance costs, and now she's struggling to pay it. My estimated payment went from $1,250 to $1,700 a month. And my mortgage company said, sorry, there's really nothing we can do to help you. I don't have a variable rate. I have a 30-year fixed mortgage. My rate's decent. Four offers have come in on this home, but all have been lower than she owes on the mortgage. Besides, each one has fallen through. I, I have considered you know, opting for a short sale or trying to do something along those lines just because you start to feel desperation, you know? I mean, I know it's not as damaging to your credit as a foreclosure. Um, at the same time, really all I have left at this point is my credit and I don't want to damage it if I can avoid it. She says it scares her to think she can't provide for her family. And I just kind of wonder, <laughs> you know, how much therapy I'm gonna need when this is all over, so. But because I know that all of this that's going on like puts stress on me and I sometimes, you know, let it spill over. Sometimes I'm short with my kids or whatever. Whether so. she lets the house go in a short sale or the right buyer soon comes yeah. along, Haley doesn't want to purchase another house. Instead, she and her kids plan to rent one. I'm Alice Collier from Money Talks America. One of the biggest questions people are asking is why home builders continue to produce new homes when they aren't selling. When we come back, we'll ask the man in the hot seat, the chief economist of the National Home Builders Association.
The market is essentially flooded with homes for sale. And it's hard to understand why the home builders keep building new ones that aren't likely to sell. One man being forced to answer those tough questions is Bernie Markstein, chief economist of the National Association of Home Builders. Ed Hyland had a chance to sit down with Bernie at a recent National Association for Business Economists conference in Washington, D.C. to talk about this issue. Thanks, Sean. I'm not sure who exactly said it first, but uh, it has been said that as housing goes, so goes the economy. Join me is Bar Bernie Markstein uh, with the National Association of Home Builders, uh, an economist. Uh, and, and Bernie, uh, how bad is it at this juncture of, of, of the association? Well, quite frankly, it is bad in terms of uh, the residential construction industry. There's been, we clearly overbuilt uh, in the 2004-2005 uh, period. We've been working off uh, excess inventory, but it's been a very slow and long process. Now, some of the, when you say about it's being bad, I mean, uh, activity, residential construction activities come down significantly, but that's to be expected because we do have high inventories and builders are making the adjustment. The unfortunate part is that there's been other fallout in the economy, most particularly problems in terms of financing, the subprime mess, et cetera, which has worsened the problem. What is the association's projection at this point for, uh, for 2008 and into the next couple of years? At this point, we're expecting, uh, we, we think we're near a bottom. Not, a, not going back to the heady days of uh, 04 or 05, uh, but a slow but steady improvement from a very low activity. We'll still have some inventory overhang that will need to be worked off, but we think we're begi we'll, we'll begin to see demand strengthen, which will help us. Has this been particularly hard to, to really peg, though? Because we've been kind of looking for that bottom, bottom in several parts of the economy for, for, for some time now, it seems. Oh, definitely. And we, we were as guilty as any economist at doing that. Uh, we thought around uh, March of last year it looked like it was bottoming. We were calling for the bottom. And then the first uh, really bad stuff from the subprime mess came out, and we started down again. Then around the summer, it looked like, again, it was bottoming. We were calling for a bottom. Then the real bad stuff uh, came out when the subprime mess spread out. It, it became not just, a, not, not just uh, the individual firms. It became the U.S., not just the U.S., even the world when we started. Uh, Bank in France got involved, et cetera. When you get to that, and that's when it really uh, all heck broke loose and uh, became a bigger problem. So. We, we're at this point, you know, people ask me, well, what are you positive about? Uh, I think all the bad news is out. I certainly hope so. I mean, we don't know what we don't know, but it's hard to believe there's much uh, bad stuff out there. So if we got all the bad stuff out there, that means we can, have, we can now we clean it up and move forward. The, the problem I think you're having is, is you've got to convince the home buyers that the bad stuff is behind you because they're the folks who are watching their home prices go down as well as their neighbors' home prices go down. And even if they were interested in, in moving, they're going, well, gee, maybe if I wait three months, six months, another year before I purchase, uh, the price of that house is going to be significantly lower because the prices do continue to drop. Well, there is this, there's, there's the fear and greed side. Uh, we've been through the greed side when we had, everybody suddenly was an investor in homes. We had the, the speculators and flippers who were going to make their fortunes, which actually added to the problem because uh, they helped the overbuilding uh, problem. And now we're into that fear part where, as exactly as you said, I don't want to buy a house and then find out three months later it's gone down in value 10, 20, even 30,000 or, or more. Uh, a, I feel like a fool. B, I've wasted money. And, uh, and then there's also this fear of being underwater where the house is worth less than your mortgage. So that, that's a definite fear. On the other hand, um, for reasonable people, we're, we're not talking about huge drops in prices. Now, there will be some markets in some places uh, where there can be fairly large uh, drops in prices. But we all have, we have to keep this in perspective. A, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, people who bought uh, say back in 2000, 2001, to maybe even 2003, even with the price drops, most of them are looking for, uh, are, are still looking at a profit on their houses. In other words, prices went up tremendously, fell, have fallen somewhat, but overall they remain up. Now, if you bought in 2005, 2006, maybe even 2004, you might be underwater, particularly if you took out a 100% uh, mortgage, because if you bought at the top of the market and you've fallen, obviously you have that problem. Okay, so let's look at the buyer today. What uh, should he or she do? 
Uh, you're sitting there, you're thinking you want to move for whatever reason, your family's gotten bigger, uh, you want to buy that first house, et cetera, and you're fearful. What I say is go out and shop around. Uh, builders are often offering uh, some sort of incentive, uh, free upgrades, they'll pay your points on your mortgage, uh, help you with your first year's payment, something like that, that you can uh, very often are, are offered. Not all places, but a lot of places do, particularly in Florida, uh, we have that. Okay, I find the house, it's a great neighborhood, it's what I'm looking for, but man, that price might fall. Well, okay, I mean, you don't have to run out and buy it. On the other hand, if it's really what you want, w these aren't stocks that you're flipping over. You're gonna live there for three, five, seven years. In most cases, and historically, if you, if you buy something, and uh, if you buy a house and hold it for five, seven years or more, the price is gonna be higher when you go to sell it than what you pay for. So even if in the short term it goes down, and it will eventually go back up because our population is growing, Florida in particular, employment growth, population growth, people, demand for housing will be back. It's just not there right now. Let me take your scenario one step. The folks find the house they're looking for, they think it's at the right price, then they try to get a loan. That is a difficult thing for a lot of people with the subprime fall, fallout right now. Definitely, and it's one of my major concerns because uh, we have people who, just as you say, they found the house, they want to buy, they're ready to buy, it's just what they want. They've even, uh, maybe even a few months ago, they went into a bank and got pre-qualified and then they, they, they even sign a, an agreement with the builder and they put in a mortgage contingency, as they well should, you want to protect yourself. Uh, it says, you know, all this good stuff about the mortgage. They go and apply, and then the bank or the whatever lender comes back and says either, I'm not going to give you a loan at all, I'm going to require a larger down payment, or, a com or I'm going to require a larger down payment and a higher interest rate than you were found acceptable, even though they're reading in the headlines about all this money available. The, tr the trouble is today, uh, if you don't have either a large payment, if you don't have a large payment and very good credit, you might find it extremely hard to get a, a loan. And that's the problem. And it's gotten to the point where people who would have qualified going, and I'm not talking about the subprime mess, I'm going, let's go back to uh, 2001, 2002 when things weren't crazy. People who would have qualified them for prime loans, in other words, we're, done, we're not even talking subprime, we're talking legitimate borrowers. Many of those people won't qualify for a loan today. And there's just no reason that we, we hear about defaults and delinquencies, yet that's largely subprime. Almost all of it is adjustable rate uh, things, uh, adjustable rate products. If you look at the people who have made fixed rate prime loans, their delinquency and defaults have not nudged from historical norms. So there's no problem there, yet there's been tightening of the standards there. If you look at subprime fixed rate loans, it's higher default and delinquency rate than prime expected because that's what subprime's all about. And it's gone up somewhat, but not that dramatically. It's all in the adjustable rate product. As you suggested at the outset, housing is a major factor in the economy. We've seen it for the, for the last uh, year and a half essentially act as a drag on the economy. It's been taking off uh, roughly 1% of growth out of the economy. If we can stop that bleeding there, the national economy will be better, and we don't want this to spread further. Let's talk a little bit about the association. Uh, are, are we in a situation where it's kind of only the strong are going to survive uh, this, this downturn right now? Are, are the, the, the mom and pops, the smaller folks, getting, getting squeezed out uh, of the home building business? In, in some cases, the mom and pops are actually in a better situation in that they don't carry heavy debt loads, they're very small operations, and they were, able to, they were able to react very quickly. It's the big builder, in some cases, the big builders who were less reactive to what was going on. Uh, and it, but you're right, I mean, ultimately, it is the strong will survive. Uh, the people who just sort of kind of turn their backs to this or, or ignore it and say, oh, well, you know, it's, it's gonna all go away. Uh, they are having problems. But, but most of the builders have, uh, have been aware that a problem was developing. We at NHB, uh, we're raising red flags for better than a year that there were problems ahead and we just they just kept getting worse and worse as uh, as we ap approached uh, the latter part of 2006 we were trying to warn our members now the members who took that to heart are in reasonably good shape and will get through this who whatever uh, whichever builders make it through this will come out on the other side stronger and be able to take advantage of the long-run need for housing we look at the national economy 
uh, we're, we're, we're projecting this year uh, housing starts of roughly, a uh, total starts of roughly a million. That's down from over two million at the peak. Way too many there. One million's low, uh, is too low for long term, but appropriate now because we have that inventory of excess housing. We see long term over the roughly a 10 year average because of, uh, of growth in the population and needs uh, in, in an aging population that we'll need one point eight five million housing starts per year. An aspect that, that I think raises a lot of concerns for people when they purchase a house and they see uh, their, their builder, for example, struggling uh, to sell some of this excess inventory and in some cases perhaps going under and not being able to continue to, to develop the neighborhood that they built their house in. Um, the, the warranties on the home you know, come into question. Some of the protections that the, the builder was offering initially may not be able to be enforced. How is the association dealing uh, with that and, and trying to assure the consumer that uh, there can be still these protections uh, built into to purchasing a house? Well, they're, they're, these are very real problems that you're talking about. It's not the common situation, but it does happen. It does occur. And I, I, quite frankly, it's not really the responsibility of the association to provide those types of guarantees. Uh, we work with our it builders and, concern, and, so. and we do try to, uh, if we could, it, it, certainly any, any help we can offer, we will offer. But uh, ultimately, we're, we're, it's, what's going to happen more often than not is a stronger builder will come in and buy up that project and perhaps be able to do things. Uh, it, it could be messy. It's messy in any bankruptcy, whether we're talking about a home builder, an auto dealer, or a dress shop. I mean, it, they're, unfortunately, people get hurt, and that's, what the, uh, w that, and that's what we're trying to prevent when we say we want uh, Congress and the administration to provide support to housing so that it doesn't spread to the innocent person who bought in, legitimately got, a, got put the down payment, uh, has a has a nice mortgage, and now they're in a development which has to, half the development has gone down the tubes, and here they're sitting in this uh, this housing development that they thought was going to be their dream, and now they have a problem. So we don't want that to spread. It, th those people shouldn't be hurt, and that's where the administration and Congress can provide some support. Not going to so solve every problem but we can try and contain the problem. You mentioned that uh, the association had seen some red flags um, uh, popping up uh, you know, on, on the screen, so to speak, uh, before it really started becoming well known that there were the, these problems developing. Um, would, would you have done something different, do you think? you think you would have you know, raised a hand or, or said something more vocally that, hey, we need to, to be on the lookout because there's some problems? Or do you think you handled it you know, pretty much the way it had to be done? We, we did what we could. I, we, and we, I, one of the concerns, both uh, from the uh, the staff of the association and the members was a speculation and how to control it. We spent, we, there, there was a long time in which we talked about, and, and, a, and a lot of builders tried to put in language into their contracts to protect themselves against speculators. Uh, the problem is, what can you do legally? And we were, even, we were even questioning and saying, well, you can try that, but we're not sure it's legal. Uh, be, because think about it, it's not the builder's responsibility to say you're not qualified to buy. That's what the mortgage lender is all about. So if they come to you with the money, want to buy, legitimate buy, appear to be a legitimate buyer, if the buyer, if the builder turns them down and says, well, we think you're a speculator, then they can come back at you. Well, you're discriminating because of our race, because of our sex. I mean, any number uh, of possibilities uh, because we do have discrimination laws, quite rightly. So you can kind of get caught on that. Uh, our builders were concerned about that. Now, I, I, in terms of warnings, I'm quite happy that we raised the warnings. And by the way, we weren't alone. It wasn't just the home builders. There were other economists and, and even commentators who were pointing that out. Just a last question. Do you see uh, something positive out of this in the sense that uh, there will be perhaps either a, a lesson learned and perhaps a stronger organization uh, that uh, will, will be able to, uh, again, do things more uh, for the consumer uh, in, in years to come? Well, in, uh, first of all, in, in terms of lessons learned, clearly in the finance market, the, the real problem is we'll learn these lessons, we'll put in uh, new guarantees, and then there will be a problem somewhere else in the financial market. These recur about every 10 to 15 years. Maybe people don't remember, but back in the early 90s, it was commercial real estate with office construction. Now it's the mortgage market. I can't tell you what it's going to be in 10 to 15 years. All I can tell you is every, things will be good. Uh, they'll have invented something quote unquote new uh, that isn't. It's a permutation on some old thing. 
and at that point they will they will go too far in the in the finance realm and we'll have a new problem uh, in terms of what the association can do I think certainly as association we have been tried to be uh, more proactive with our members uh, try to educate the public more so I presumably we're always trying to get better and this will help us get better excellent Bernie thank you so much for joining us here on Money Talks America we really appreciate it my pleasure Ed. all right and back to you Sean when we come back, my final thoughts on the housing crisis and what the future holds. innovative anthrax vaccine, promising research on cancer, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, and advanced laser developments. In their search for new answers and better solutions, UCF professors are awarded millions of dollars in research funding each year. Needless to say, we're all quite proud of them. UCF stands for opportunity. Welcome back to Money Talks America. The historic housing boom has given way to an equally historic housing bust. How did all this happen? Well, despite improvements in supply chain management, we've not reached the point of just-in-time housing. When the housing boom set in, prices began to soar. Acting on this price signal, builders began to build at a record pace. They not only met new demand, they exceeded it. As the housing market slowed, then stagnated, inventories of housing continued to rise to record levels. After this happened, builders cut back and housing starts plummeted. But it was too late to prevent the problem. Now that supply exceeds demand, prices are headed in the other direction. When does it all end? Well, once the market finds balance, which could be in a matter of months, but it could take more than a year. Builders, buyers, and bankers are all going to tiptoe back into the housing waters. Nobody's going to run to the end of the pier and dive in headlong. I'm Sean Snaith. Thanks for joining us. Today 